Welcome back. She's done it all, film, television and theatre, from Lady Macbeth to Queen Elizabeth II. But one character the world will never forget is Moneypenny to Piers Brosnan's James Bond. She's now in a new West End Oscar Wilde production, An Ideal Husband. And if you haven't figured it out yet, the name is Bond, Samantha Bond. And she joins me now. Welcome. Welcome Hello. indeed. And we were talking there about all the acting things you've done. We were just talking, just before we, while the commercial break was on, um, about the fact that also it's possible that one of your two children will follow you into, the, yes, into I've, this, I've... this game. And do you recommend they do? It's a really hard one. You know, uh, uh, when they were growing up, we kept hoping they'd be scientists or doctors or lawyers, you know, something sensible. And, um, and now that they're kind of reaching adulthood, I, I'm kind of of the opinion that if, if it's what they really want to do, then let them do it. You know, it's what I really wanted to do, and there's no wood to touch. Um, it's no. kind of gone all right. And, yes. you know, I, life is insecure, yes. actually. It's Did your parents, they, were they delighted you took this move, or were uh, they no. traditional? Well, my parents were both um, in the business. In the business. My mm. dad's an actor, my mum had been an actress, was a television producer. And I was made to stay at school. I had to get all my exams. And then my mum made me do, before I was allowed to go to drama school, she made me do shorthand and typing just in case. Just in case. Yes. That's right. Just, just to be on the safe side, Indeed. as my mother used to say about things. Just to be on the safe side. And now you're in The Ideal, ideal Husband here in the West End. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time in 20 years, roughly, of marriage that you've actually co-starred, acted with yeah. your husband. It is. We've done one radio play in 22 years. I see. Well, we, we couldn't see how you were getting on together in that one, obviously. <laughs> uh, but the uh, but is it is it different? Is it? It is different. I mean, it's been parts of it have been bizarrely normal. So when you're when you're playing with him on the stage, it's actually very very normal. It's like playing with any other actor, except it's an actor you know very well. Um, and there are moments when when you've been in previews and you're very frightened, and you look up into those eyes and it's the eyes of the man that you love and you suddenly feel a bit safer, although he can look into your eyes and see the terror that's in yeah, them. Yes, yes. Um, so that's been comforting. And the, the weird bit is actually the going home at night. Because Must you, be, yeah. you can't say, well, how was your day, darling? Y yes, because you know all about it. You know exactly how the day went, you know what went wrong, you know what went right. So that's... And I'm trying to forget it, you say, yeah. to one another. It's just as well the cricket's on now. Yes. So we can both go home, have dinner in front of the cricket. Cricket. That's yeah. perfect. perfect. Perfect solution. And uh, are you enjoying The Ideal Husband particularly? Because it's, it's had great reaction. So I, so I gather, yeah. Um, it's, um, it's a wonderful play. It's a brilliantly... I mean, when we, we talk about these classics, and they're classics because they're beautiful. It's like a beautiful old car. It's beautifully crafted. It's beautifully written. Um, it's the most fantastic plot. The plot is kind of like a thriller, and yet, because it's Oscar Wilde, by the time you get to the fourth act, you're almost in a farce. I mean, it's, it's, and it's glorious to, to listen to the audience reaction. You know, they think they're watching a political something, which it yeah. is, yeah. Um, and then it is screamingly funny. Yeah. So it's a great, it's a real joy to play. Well, Oscar Wilde, of course, uh, was never one of the scriptwriters on James Bond. He wasn't, no. Uh, no, he, one of the disappointments of his career. <laughs> but, the, and, uh, but in terms of James Bond, how did it happen that you suddenly took over as Money Penny? Um, well, they were changing Bonds, um, they were changing M's, um, and they decided to change Money Penny. And I have a theory that there were three of us on a short list, and they were called Smith, Jones, and Bond. <laughs> And who yeah. would you go for? Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, it's been great fun doing it. Yeah, and people, people remember the films because they're on television all the time when yeah. they're not in the cinema. And so you get people come out up to you in the street or in the tube or whatever. Uh, you, you do, you do. I went into, I was having my pre-theatre dinner and I was getting a take, take away from a restaurant opposite. And he looked at me and he went, you can have that for free because you make me laugh in the Bond films. Ah. So that was a little perk, I thought. That was very good. Yes, and you were the only often. and you were the only money penny to get or give a kiss to James Bond. Absolutely true. Yeah. It was in in, in the in the um, actual film it is a fantasy sequence, but obviously you had to do it properly when when you were filming it. Mm. So it was a very, very charming morning's work. Oh, mm. And do you think um, Daniel C Craig was a good choice to take over? I think his he's bond? a great bond. Mm. Yeah, I think the first Bond film that he did, um, which is 
Casino Royale, yeah. I thought was one of the great Bond films. Yes, yes, I thought and stronger than the second one. Yeah. Fact. Yeah. But it was one of the great Bond films, isn't it? Because you've seen, I bet you've seen them all, obviously. I'm ashamed to say, have. Sir David, that but I haven't. As in, <laughs> well, it gets more and more difficult when the title, and they're inventing titles, and there's some of them, to die but not to. Absolutely. Or, you know, strange titles like that at the end. Yeah. You know. Never, I mean, ever even, ask me even which so, the films even some of the, I was just looking at some of these titles. I'll find them in a minute. But anyway, but they're all sort of die another day. or. I think I'm in that one. I think that, yeah. Yeah. I think yes, I you were in that. One. Okay. And uh, but I mean, but they're very uh, inscrutable, right? They than, are. You know. But uh, what about dream parts? Uh, uh, Money Penny kind of been a, a light-hearted dream, but is there some ambition that you have in store? The trouble with talking about dreams is that I, I'm always superstitious. That if I were to say publicly, I'd like to play that, that somehow that pricks the mm. dream bubble. Mm -hmm. um, there are obviously, the, you know, the classics still to come and then the wonderful thing about being an actor is that the dream parts sometimes haven't even been written yet uh, I when I was lucky enough to do Amy and Amy's view opposite Judy Dench and that script David Hare's script arrived through my front door and it, it hadn't been you know it was brand new and oh. it's like a newborn baby so it the, the exciting thing about being in this world is that you never quite know what dream you're hoping for no and and you're slightly superstitious Terribly about about naming one of them mm. yes yeah because it it may not may not come to pass yeah uh, and the one other thing that comes to me is, is did you in this experience now the ideal husband um, did you learn things working with your husband that you didn't know in all the 20 years when you've been not working with him well you I'd, I'd always had this theory that we worked differently and uh, I've always described actors as, as sort of two basic camps. There are jumpers and builders. And I'm a jumper, and being a jumper involves running very, very fast at a cliff. Right. Okay? And then when you get to the cliff edge, you jump, and two things can happen. Right. Either you fly, yeah. and it was a good idea, yeah. or you crash land to the beach, and it wasn't. Yeah. My husband is a builder, so whilst I'm running at this cliff, he's very carefully doing building blocks like this. Oh, I see. So, it, so he'll survive longer then? Does he survive longer? Oh, well, yes, he doesn't crash land. Yes, I yes, don't think he'd know. Yeah, exactly. and, what about, and what about in terms of, uh, of him, him and his career, and your, you and your career, that you had a year or so uh, holiday from the marriage? I mean, you were still mm. married, but I mean, you s split up for a year or so, didn't you? And we did, but that was a hundred years ago. When the ch kids were small yeah. And, yeah. and all of that. But what brought you together again? Um, I think what had happened is because the children came so quickly, so we'd only been married a year when I was pregnant. Then we had a baby, then I was pregnant. Uh, I seemed to be pregnant for years. It was sort of... I know. Um, and well, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's nonsense. But it's a but wonderful I know what you image. mean, is what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that, that you, we just kind of lost track of one another, really. Um, and was there a, wonder, a magic moment, a, the bell tower tolling or something, a moment when you think, we must get together again? I'd taken his granny to see him in, um, ironically, Arcadia, which he did 17 years ago and I did last year. And we, he drove me home. So we dropped Granny at the hotel and we drove home and he said, I miss you. And that was it. I know, it's sweet, Good. isn't it? it's lovely. But we've, still, we've been back together now longer than most theatrical marriages last. So yes, I'm so you've won on both scores. That's mm. a very, very t touching tale. Thank oh. you very much, Samantha, and we hope, hope we'll see you again soon. Bless you, thank you. Samantha Bond there, whom I talked to earlier. Now, the Middle East peace process. It's once again, as you may have noticed, at a standstill. Negotiations resumed in September after a year-long impasse but were derailed when a moratorium on settlement building in the West Bank ended in October. Palestinian President Abbas, he has said that he will walk away from talks if settlement building continues. But as Benjamin Netanyahu tries to revive the building freeze in the West Bank, he faces strong opposition from within his own coalition government. To find out more about the future, if there is a future, of the peace process, I spoke earlier to the Israeli historian Ilan Pape. He has just released a book co-authored with Noam Chomsky, Gaza in Crisis, Israel's War on the Palestinians. Do you see those talks 
resuming again soon, or do you feel there's an implacable divide? The talks may, may resume. I mean, there's such a heavy pressure by the American administration on the Israeli government that it's very difficult to see how could they dare and uh, refuse President Obama's direct uh, uh, demand. However, I think even if the talks were to resume, there's very little chance of progress. Uh, the positions of the two sides are very uh, different, and there's no real will, I think, or especially on the Israeli side, uh, to change the reality on the ground or to pay any significant price in order to advance the, the, the chances of peace. And meanwhile, Palestinians talk about, in fact, uh, having a, declaring a Palestinian state. Does that have any hopes? Well, uh, of course... Or is it doomed? Yeah, theoretically, there could be, like in Kosovo, a unilateral declaration mm -hmm. of state by uh, the Palestinian Authority. My guess is that the scenario in this case would be a unilateral Israeli retaliation by annexing the Ure, all those areas in the West Bank that the Israelis deem as being part of the future Greater Israel, and leaving the uh, single state in a kind of a Bantustan situation. So I don't think that that declaration would again be a fundamental uh, uh, factor on the ground and the basic balance of power and the basic oppression and colonization of the Palestinian territories would continue even after such a declaration. Do you actually think it's an inadvisable to do that declaration? I mean, yes. does it achieve anything? You've mentioned some of the bad results of it. Does it achieve anything at the same time? No, Apparently uh, not. Uh, probably not, although I, I can't see, it. in a way, I don't see any difference between the Palestinian Authority's position now and the Palestinian Authority position after a unilateral declaration. In both cases, it's quite dismal and not very uh, uh, promising. Uh, I, I, I just think that this is not the kind of uh, development we need to trigger a different thinking. And I think this is what Noam Chomsky and I talk about in the book, is that we, we, we think that the world has to adopt a new paradigm, a new perspective uh, on the question of Israel and Palestine. We are What's stuck. That? Uh, what we would ha it be? We have a difference of opinion there. That's why we wrote together the book. He thinks, uh, if I may represent him for a second, that <laughs> there, <laughs> which uh, I, I, I'll try and do, that the world has to go back to the idea of a, a genuine sovereign Palestinian independence. He thinks that the peace process has uh, neglected and had abandoned the idea of a genuine Palestinian state. People talk about Palestinian state, but they don't really mean that. They mean a kind of a, a Bantustan. And I believe that we have to think seriously about the idea of a one-state solution. The one-state solution rather than the famous two-state. Exactly. People sometimes say it's got to be a three-state as well. But the one-state, how, would how would that work? Because it would involve um, as many s n torture negotiations as what we're talking about now, wouldn't it? I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu would have to agree things about the way of life in this new yeah. unified country that I, I doubt if he could say, uh, push himself to do. Well, he's not the person to push forward anything, I think. He won't push for a two-state solution, and he won't push for a one-state solution. I think what is uh, remarkable about the one-state solution, that at least there is a correspondence between the reality on the ground and the idea. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Israel is now controlling the whole of Palestine. So what we're talking here is a kind of a change of regime rather than creating two new states. Whereas in the case of the two-state solution, it is a topic that is discussed in the corridors of power, but anyone visiting the ground, the, the place itself, sees no correlation between this idea and the fact that there is one regime controlling Israel and Palestine today, which is the Israeli government and state in an oppressive, discriminatory way, different but, regimes. But and we have what, to change would, that. Yeah, but how do you change their policies? Okay, I, th I think what you do, you can change gradually some of the most uh, 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 absurd discriminations, such as the apartheid wall, such as the presence of tanks and military powers inside Palestinian cities. And then you move on much more incrementally and slowly into ne renegotiating the constitutional basis for six million Jews and six million Palestinians to decide how do they share the future. And I think that uh, 
a, a, a far heavier pressure on Israel, even in the form of partial sanctions or full sanctions, is the only thing that would trigger a change in the Israeli position. Uh, I, I myself really think that the present Israeli government is in such a mindset that only if it would be treated the way that apartheid South Africa was, was treated, there's a chance for a fundamental change on the ground. And they would not change unless the Western world would send them a very clear message. W you are not accepted in the group of civilized nations as long as you continue these kinds of policies and as long as you stick to these kinds of attitudes. Thank you for your help on that. And, uh, we thank you very much, David, for having me. Thank you very look much. Look forward to welcoming you back again. OK, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, now, watching that interview with me and here now to give us the official Israeli government line on the situation, I'm delighted to be joined from Jerusalem by the Prime Minister's own spokesman, Mark Regev. Welcome back, Mark. What comments do you have to make on what Mr. Pape had to say there? Well, we've heard the opinions of, of one academic. Uh, I suppose if you had 150 academics, you'll get 150 different opinions. It's, it's easy to sit in an ivory tower on some Western university and to pontificate. I think that's, that's easy. The question is, what, what is the reality on the ground? And the reality on the ground is that uh, the overwhelming majority of Palestinians, Palestinians, the overwhelming majority of Israelis want a two-state solution. And we'll allow academics can have their opinions, but it's just not serious. A one I think state the only people in the region who support a one-state solution are the extremists, people like Hamas and Hezbollah and the Iranians who believe Israel should be wiped off the map. That's the only serious constituency that supports a one-state solution. And, of course, they are opposed to peace and opposed to reconciliation. At this point in proceedings, we've got uh, Benjamin Netanyahu with considerable op opposition to the new 90-day freeze and so on. Are you confident that's going to carry the day through? Well, obviously, we're not there yet. But I think there was a, a, a strong amount of optimism when we started this round of the peace process in September. Then we're in this bump in the road at the moment and things are not moving forward. I'm hopeful that we can get over this current impasse and return to direct negotiations with the Palestinians. And I think if we do so, there's a good chance to reach a historic agreement. My Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is committed to a historic reconciliation with the Palestinians, a historic peace agreement. He thinks it's possible, and he believes the only way to get that is through direct negotiations, and it's time to start those talks. What is the attitude of the Cabinet there? Well, the, the, I think the government is united in that uh, we want to see the peace process move forward. Obviously, you're right that in the Israeli cabinet, we have a coalition government. There are different parties, some on the right, some on the left. You know that the uh, Israeli Labour Party, headed by Ud Barak, is part of my prime minister's coalition. So we've got a coalition, as I say, that, that covers a large part of the Israeli political spectrum. And this is something that the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, believes very firmly, that if he can reach a historic agreement with the Palestinians. He has the ability to deliver that agreement because if he can find an agreement acceptable, and he is known in Israel as Mr. Security, yes, if he can find such an agreement acceptable, then he believes that the overwhelming majority of the Israeli public will support that deal. And I think the Palestinians should take heed of that. That, in fact, he has the ability to, providing what he comes forward to the is Israeli people and the right wing and so on, if it's credible coming from Benjamin Netanyahu, he's got the ability to carry it through. I believe that's 100 percent true. And I think the Palestinians should, should put away their preconditions. We should negotiate. I know that there are gaps in the positions between both sides. There are historic gaps separating the Israeli narrative from the Palestinian narrative. But I would ask the Palestinian leadership, how do you expect to solve problems without talking? How do you expect to make peace without, without engaging with Israel? How do you accept to, expect to achieve Palestinian independence without talking to Israel? And our challenge is to find a way in which Palestinians achieve independence and sovereignty and Israel's security is, is guaranteed. That's the challenge and that's what we have to achieve. So, Mark, what, what are the Israeli preconditions to a resumption of negotiations? We don't have any whatsoever. We think that talks should immediately start again without any preconditions from any side. 
Of course, we have positions in the negotiations, but we don't make any of them a precondition. We don't say to the Palestinians, you have to accept our position, otherwise we won't talk. And I think this is a mistake the Palestinians are making today when they put on the table all these preconditions and say, up front, Israel has to do all this. If they don't, we won't agree to negotiate. I think that's not a clever way of doing business. But you have some preconditions, don't you, um, in this situation, like, for instance, Israel being recognized as a Jewish state. That's, that's one of your preconditions, isn't it? It's not a precondition for talks. We don't say that Palestinians have to accept that position before we're willing to negotiate. So it's not right. a precondition. It is what we believe is an essential element in any peace agreement. And ultimately, I'd put it this way. Israel, we are asked to say that there's a Palestinian people with a historic connection to this land, with a right to self-determination, a right to independence and sovereignty. And we're willing to say all that. We're willing to accept Palestinian national uh, uh, aspirations. But surely, in parallel, we should hear the same mirror language from the Palestinian leadership, that there is a Jewish people with a historic connection to this soil, uh, with a right to self-determination in its own state, the state of Israel. And I would ultimately ask the Palestinians, if the Jewish state is illegitimate in their eyes, if the Jewish state is a legitimate part of the neighborhood, are you really, off really offering us real peace? Because if we're illegitimate, uh, what sort of peace are you offering us? Following the talks between Mr. Netanyahu and Hillary Clinton, are, are the United States and Israel uh, marching to the same songbook, to mix our metaphors, uh, are closer now than they were a month or two ago? I believe so. We're not there yet. The negotiations are ongoing, but the common goal is clear. To overcome the current impasse in the talks and to get back to direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. What has been important with the Americans is that we've decided on a parallel track. Uh, obviously, the Israeli-Palestinian talks, we hope, will be resumed and go ahead, uh, 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 full steam ahead. In parallel to that, there'll be an Israeli-American dialogue on the security issues involved. Because everyone understands an Israeli pull out of the West Bank entails a security risk, because the West Bank is at the, in, near the very heart of Israel. The West Bank overlooks our most important population centers, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. It overlooks our economic centers and so forth. And in pulling out of territories like that, there's a security risk involved. And the idea of an expanded American-Israeli security cooperation, uh, which will parallel the peace agreement, is to uh, minimize, to mitigate the security risks involved in a pullout, and that's very important. It can help make peace more doable. And what about, uh, Mark, the situation, President Obama, with the suggestion of 20 F-35 fighter jets and so on, does that change the, change the military situation in the Middle East or reassure Israel or frighten the Palestinians or what? I think the idea is to make sure that Israel's uh, qualitative edge is maintained. I mean, there are a lot of challenges out there. I mean, you're talking about the Palestinians, and hopefully we'll have peace with them soon. But we have people over the horizon who say Israel should be wiped off the map. We have people across the horizon, specifically the regime in Iran, who uh, make no bones about it. Uh, they think Israel should be wiped out, and they've got very aggressive programs in missiles, in nuclear weapons, and so forth. Obviously. We have to make sure that Israel has the ability to defend herself if, if required to do so. Mark, thank you very much indeed for joining us, as ever. Greetings, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Mark Regev there. And that's all we have time for this week. So my thanks to all of our guests today. And do join me again in seven days' time for another Frost Over the World. Until then, goodbye for now. <laughs>